And when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. And if we're talking tight ends and we're going into round two, maybe round three, give me Ian Thomas, please. Just let's, I mean, let's just do the damn thing. Just based on giving his overall ability. Um, again, I like his arm. I think he can make every throw. The pick at number 12 is in. Welcome back. Cover one NFL draft podcast. I'm Russell Brown, CP Christian Page joining me uh, before he goes on his trip to uh, Mobile for the Senior Bowl. CP, how we doing? Doing great. I'm super excited. It's like the I can see what's like just driving down the road. I can see it opening up in front of me. And I'm just picturing everything that was going to take part this week in Mobile. So I'm super excited. Yeah, I'm with you, dude. I just found out that me and Eric Turner are uh, taking the same flight from Atlanta to uh, Mobile on Monday. Uh, so we will arrive uh, at eight o'clock in Mobile at the same time. It's going to be great. Um, so it's always fun being able to kind of sit on the plane with them. We, we get to chat for like an hour, just me and him probably watch a little film. It's always a good time. So it's exciting. Um, and I was thinking of something I'm flying out of DTW, which is for Detroit. And I don't think there'll be lion staff there because it's Monday. They should be down there already. But I was thinking about that. I was like, man, I could have like an entire lion staff with me on this plane. And that happened to me last year. I had like nine scouts from the lions on my plane. So I'm kind of curious how it happens because the lions are coaching the North roster at the senior bowl. The Cincinnati Bengals are coaching the South roster uh, for the senior bowl. But before we jump into the senior bowl, let's talk Clemson. Let's talk LSU national championship game. First quarter and a half felt like Clemson was maybe in control and maybe they were going to just bury Joe Burrow and he figured things out. Clemson falls apart a little bit and LSU does what LSU does and Burrow scores six touchdowns and everything looks like normal and LSU completes the perfect season, 15-0 and national champions. Uh, what was your takeaway from this game just as, as, a, as a fan of football and then we'll get into some of the prospects from this game. I mean, pretty much the same thing I took away from the LSU-Oklahoma game. I mean, of course, it wasn't as dominant uh, on LSU's part as it was uh, playing Oklahoma as it was Clemson, but still just it, – it, I just enjoyed it. I mean, that's it's just one of those teams where you just, like, don't sit there and try to nitpick at anything they don't do, which there's not many of that, but just enjoy one of the best college football teams ever. Enjoy one of the best quarterbacks in college football history, and that's what we saw. I mean, Clemson battled. Uh, in the first half, like you talked about, but LSU, I think their defense, I, I don't think they got enough credit this year overall. They played better down the stretch, but I think their defense definitely kind of, you know, put their foot down and said, hey, we're going to win this this football game in the second half. We know how explosive our offense is, but, you know, you saw Christian Fulton get beat up a little bit in the first half, but then you saw him kind of buckle down. Caleb on chase on constant pressure in the backfield, and that put pressure on Trevor Lawrence, who's going to be probably the number one overall prospect entering next uh, draft season. And he made him look just very pedestrian. You know, a lot of high throws um, didn't really have that chemistry going with his wide receivers. And then they took away the run game, which I think Clemson should have gone back to the run game. because Travis Etienne was having a heck of a game between uh, the tackles and then in the screen game. They sniffed, they sniffed that out a little bit. Uh, but I think LSU's defense overall – gets kind of overlooked by its explosive offense, rightly so. I think LSU's defense needs to get more credit about this victory in this season because they proved that they were worth national championship caliber in the performance against Clemson. And I think with this game, and I know, you know, and that's, this is something that I, I kind of don't like what, what people were doing. Like they were ripping on A.J. Terrell, the corner from Clemson, and I get it. He had a rough day. I mean, Jamar Chase was taking him to the woodshed a little bit, but Joe Burrow was placing some of those passes in only – the, the most perfect spot. I mean, yep. no matter what Terrell did, he wasn't making a play on the football. And there was times that he was in perfect position and there was just nothing that he could do. And he made some really good plays. He showed his physicality. Now there are times kind of like greedy Williams last year that I noticed he would almost like false step 
out of his back pedal, rather than taking that step back, he's instantly going for that jam and that press and he false steps forward. But because of, you know, the ability of Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase, they kind of made him look foolish at times. And it allowed them to get a little bit of separation to create a, a small window for, uh, for, for Joe Burrow to, to, to place it right in the bucket and make some of those throws. So that was something I noticed a little bit, but I thought he looked good. I, I think he's probably going to fall into that, you know, late second, third round caliber type of corner. Maybe he slips into the, to the second round earlier, but I, I don't see that happening. And, and the only reason why I think maybe he could is maybe because guys like Paulson Adebo uh, went back to school and stuff like that. But generally speaking, he, He's a good corner, and he matched up uh, against NFL talent. It wasn't just LSU where they played NFL talent all year. Clemson played Virginia. Clemson has played talented teams all year long. Texas A&M earlier in the year, they've got a trio of wide receivers we could see in the draft. So um, for people that discredit A.J. Terrell, I think that's a little ridiculous. But on the other uh, defensive side of the football, the secondary-wise, I mean – Grant Delpit, I thought, played pretty well. I thought he kind of solidified himself near the top of the class for for being the best safety, which is where I have him. I think he's the best safety in the class. Um, but he, I mean, he made he made some plays down at the line of scrimmage. He flashed that range again. But really, the, I think the guy that stood out the most, and yeah, Caleb on Chase, and we could talk about him and, and and how he was penetrating the backfield, the pressure that he was able to generate consistently throughout the night. But the one player, Patrick Queen, linebacker for them fits today's athletic mold for the, the linebacker position uh, around 6'1", 230, 235, might even be a hair under 230. But either way, he showed range and he made plays all over the field with eight tackles. And he was a guy that really, I think, took advantage of this game, put himself on the map, and then he declares for the NFL draft. So we'll see him in the, in the 2020 NFL draft. I don't think either one of us have watched Patrick Queen in depth, but just what's your spin on him and, and overall what, what you thought, what, what, you, what you saw? Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, just having that range to cover sideline to sideline, the athleticism, because it's one thing about being smart and diagnosing a play, but some uh, inside linebackers don't have necessarily the acceleration or you know the agility in their lower body to make a play on the football. He can diagnose and he can react to it while also making – ball which I think is super important and just relating this to the draft class there's some holes in the linebacker class mm -hmm. it's not necessarily solidified all the way around um, so I think Queen definitely uh, uh, made his mark to be one of the top linebackers picked in this class and I mean I don't think there's uh, uh, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he's he might be a top 50 pick with his performance and he's he's been good all year but he's just been kind of overshadowed by you know the Derek Stingley's the Grant Delpits the Christian the chase ons and even Rashard Lawrence in the interior uh, defensive line who actually had a solid game as well. So I'm with you. I think Queen's a stud at linebacker. I think he may be a little uh, uh, versatile too, if you were just depending on scheme, but I think he, he checks a lot of boxes when you look at the athletic profile and just his overall range uh, and just instincts in general. I think he's a very fun evaluation. Yeah, I think he's a perfect fit as a will linebacker. Um, and again, he's going to take advantage of a weak linebacker class where, you know, we saw Dylan Moses go back to school. We have a guy like Joe Bocci who from Michigan State, he's got a ton of, an you know, a ton of questions to answer with the PEDs and, you know, missing really the last four or five games of the year does him no good. But overall, where, where you look at a linebacker in Isaiah Simmons, which is where I think he'll project just simply because you can drop him into coverage, you can rush him off the edge like that, and you've kind of got him in the middle of your defense as a, as a core nucleus for your defense. But overall, yeah, I mean, he, he, was, he was great in that game, and, and I think he's, a, he's certainly a guy that uh, is going to boost up draft boards, probably going to have a good combine, um, probably will have a good pro day, should have some good interviews, you would hope. Um, so we'll see where he falls. I don't think he's going to go round one. Maybe he does, but he took advantage of an opportunity. I mean, like you said, he was overshadowed uh, really much of his career. I mean, last year he was there behind Devin White. This year it looked like Jacob Phillips was the guy. Uh, and then there's just so much talent on that defense and on that roster as a whole. I mean, they lost nine players. They're they're a play caller in Joe Brady. They lost their D coordinator. I mean, LSU's got a big, tough task, and they'll be a fun team to kind of evaluate during the summer. And 
where, where they'll be next year. But uh, what, what, a, what a game it was. And, I mean, I'm glad LSU won. That was the team I wanted to win. Um, but if I was a betting man, I was going to bet Clemson if, if I would have been betting on that game. But one thing I, I probably – if I would have bet on, I probably would have lost money on was Travis Etienne going back to school. I would not have taken that bet. I would have said, no, he's going pro. I mean, he solidified himself as my RB3, uh, you know, top 30 player. And he was in that top 30 range for me all year long, even, you know, before the season. And now I look at it and, you know, maybe he is making the, the, the right decision. Obviously, from a personal standpoint, he wants to get his degree. He wants to stay at Clemson and do some things. But what was your take? Were you genuinely shocked by this or are, are you kind of thinking what I'm thinking? It's a good move for him. Yeah, I think you can say a little bit of both. And again, kind of with like the Tua Tungavailoa decision. I don't know if there's necessarily a wrong decision. Um, there's probably a smart decision. I think Tua made the smart decision by going pro. But with ETN, I'm kind of on the fence, you know, because we talked about how he could kind of be grouped in with those RB1 guys. You know, you talk about Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins, among some others, and ETN's right in that mix. But, you know, if you look at next year's running back class, then he's coming into the season as RB1. I don't think there's uh, – really. there may be some questions out there, you know, just depending on – uh, who who we study going forward. But, yeah, overall, I, I was surprised because I thought he had um, a really good playoff series. He looked good all season long. Sure, he didn't have the gaudy numbers he did a year ago, but who cares? I mean, he still, you know, had an incredible season. But I think just how he is utilized in that Clemson offense, how effective he is as a receiver, even in, in the screen game or just some angle routes or in the flats, his vision in between the tackles and just his accelerator, it's ridiculous of how quick. Yeah how fast he can just turn on the Jets, which, you know, if you just go from – if you want any running back in this in this class, which the former class, I guess you say, with ETN, if you want them to get to A to B as quickly as possible, ETN's your guy because he can turn those Jets on. And you saw that against Ohio State when he caught a screen pass or in the flats and he just busted it out for, you know, a 45, 50-yard touchdown, whatever it may have been. But um, just based on some of his attributes and his overall ability, I think he was NFL ready. Um, but maybe he just maybe he just wants to win another championship, and Clemson definitely has the firepower in offense with Justin Ross, Lawrence, and ETM returning to definitely get there. So um, again, I don't think there was a wrong decision here, um, it, but it definitely did surprise me. Yeah, it surprised me as well. And I mean, like you said, I, I think you know I was a little bit on the fence, but I'm I'm okay with him going back because I never viewed him as a running back one, and I think I might have even said that during a. a a pre-draft show, maybe back in the summer or, or whatever it was, but no matter how much, you know, he, he flashed that, it, that acceleration, that burst and everything else. And kind of like that aggressive running style, because he does run with some power. He just, he never really did it for me to like flip the switch and say, okay, this is the top back. But at the same time, like I, I wanted to see him at the next level because I thought he would have been like a really good fit in like Seattle to, to go and compliment Chris Carson, like Chris Carson, a powerful runner an aggressive runner, but he's going to be coming back from an injury. So maybe you bring in a guy like Travis Etienne who would compliment him and, and kind of almost, you know, keep Chris Carson upright, but you can utilize him in the passing game. And then another team that came to mind was like Atlanta. I thought he would have been a perfect fit there because the, the history with Freeman and how many times he gets injured and just his aggressive running style, it doesn't necessarily match up for the longevity that you want with a, with a player at, at that position for their career. And they do have Ido Smith, but I mean, he took a, a big shot and had a neck injury, a concussion earlier in the year too. So I thought, you know, ETN would have been an ideal fit for them in their offense, but he goes back, he's going to try to solidify himself as the top back for next year he's going to get his degree and and maybe you know most importantly outside of that from the football perspective he's going to maybe win a national championship again so or at least put them back in the running so we'll see what happens on all that um we didn't have I mean I don't think we had any other you know players declare you know that were real shocking but we did have some stuff as far as the senior bowl goes um Kenny Willekes from Michigan State was added uh to the roster which I'm happy to see obviously I like seeing a, a Michigan State Spartan on on the roster and and at the event and I think he's going to actually have a really good week I'm curious what he does at the point of attack uh with with consistent hand usage and really how he does as far as creating separation um, and, and being able to not expose his chest to an offensive tackle in the run game. So we'll see what he does there. But um, any, any other names that, that I might've missed just now? I know we had two before we got on the air. 
Yeah, I'm not too sure. Um, I'm trying to figure out the order of all of it. But, no, I think – I mean, most of the rosters were solidified a while back. I guess the LSU guys um, – was uh, Lloyd Cushenberry is going to yep. join the, the team. So, we heard that because I guess he was one of those graduate juniors. Um, and so, he declared early, I believe, and that he's on the roster. I feel like there was another LSU guy as well. But um, – Yeah, I mean, they. I, I just pulled up the, the page. Uh, yeah, Damian Lewis and then – um, you had uh, Charlie Heck from North Carolina and then Austin mm-hmm. Mack, wide receiver from Ohio State. Those are the most recent ones in probably the last two or three hours. Um, we know Joe Burrow will not be at the event. He declined uh, respectfully, uh, taking a break. And to be honest, he doesn't need to be at the Senior Bowl. He's going to be the number one pick. Um, yeah. Is it Cincinnati that takes him? I don't know. We'll see with, with how Carolina shaping up. And I guess that's kind of a fun question to ask. If Carolina shapes up with Joe Brady and everything else, do they maybe package something together with some future assets, a couple of assets in this draft, and Cam Newton to get the number one pick? Do you think it's a possibility, or is that just a pipe dream? Because I think it's a pipe dream. Yeah, I think it is because I don't know how sexy of a quarterback Cam Newton is right now to teams, Mm -hmm. especially sacrificing, you know, Joe Burrow, who, you know, 24-year-old quarterback that, and maybe the best college football quarterback, or at least had the best season for a quarterback in college football. So it's kind of hard to throw everything at, you know, Cincinnati in that regard, including Cam Newton, for them to be like, yeah, that's justifiable. Let's go forward with it. But I I don't think – I think there's too many – well, this sounds strange. I think there's too many assets on Cincinnati um, to pass up a franchise quarterback in Joe Burrow because I think skill wise on offense they're they're pretty solid they can add a few more pieces um you know maybe another backup running back or some uh pieces on uh, the offensive line and the receiving core but you know last year they drafted Jonah Williams um they already have you know I think if Joe Burrow is the selection AJ Green that's more convincing for him to stay Tyler Boyd stepped up the past couple seasons if he can continue to stay healthy I think Joe Mixon's a fine running back I think you also have some pieces. And John Ross, if he evolves and he stays healthy, then you have a lot of pieces offensively where I think it's like, hey, let's just get our franchise quarterback and let's not worry about Cam Newton, who, you know, we may extend him to three more years, but how many games is he going to play in that three-year span? So I'm with you. I think it's a pipe dream in that sense. I don't think there's really a pitch out there that Cincinnati may not even listen to. Yeah, I mean, if I'm them, I'm I'm sitting there and I'm going, hey, he's the top player on our board. I mean, you would almost need like a Ricky Williams type of trade where you're getting like an entire draft to yourself for the year plus Cam Newton yeah. and maybe even a couple of other picks because, I mean, I think Joe Burrow is, is a 15-year pro at least. I mean, I would be absolutely floored if he comes into the league and I'm not saying, you know, 5,000 plus yards, 60 touchdowns, but I would be floored if he if – he, came in the league and just didn't pan out like at all. Like it may, maybe he lasts seven or eight years, you know, I, I would be a, okay. That's acceptable. But I, I genuinely feel like we're, we're going to see a guy that's going to take over the league, be the face of the league. And I, I feel that confident about him because he just looked that good in that offense. Now, maybe it was the offense. Maybe it was the players around him. But if he goes to a team like Cincinnati, like you said, he gets Tyler Boyd. He gets uh, A.J. Green. He's got Joe Mixon. He's got some players around him that's going to make him good. And he's got you know some players on that offensive line. They weren't very good this past year. They were uh, quite injured. But overall, they, they were missing a quarterback. Andy Dalton's no good. Ryan Finley, we, we've talked about that numerous times already. So I'm not even going to get on that rant again. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, so Joe Burrow, I'm excited to see him in, in Cincinnati. And I'm, I'm excited to see how it, it plays out uh, throughout the process. I mean, I, that's just my assumption. But let's go to the Senior Bowl. Enough of LSU, Clemson. If we talk about any of those players here, uh, that's fine, you know, as far as LSU and Clemson. But we've got quite a few players that uh, we're excited to see. And I guess we'll just kind of go down the list, you know, player by player, taking turns, whatever. Um, I'll start, I guess. One guy I'm really excited about, you know, obviously I could talk about the entire Utah team, but I'll hold back on that because we've done enough Utah discussion. Uh, one player, Darnay, Darnay Holmes, uh, cornerback, defensive back out of UCLA. I'm, I'm intrigued to see him. When I was watching Anthony Gordon um, 
And then I watched UCLA, Anthony Gordon, quarterback for Washington State. He'll be somebody I've talked briefly about in, if, in case you don't. Um, but, you know, I watched UCLA against Washington State. Then I watched UCLA against San Diego State. I watched both their offense and defense. And he was a player that, that kind of stood out to me. Um, just I, I, I liked some of the things that I saw. I thought he was athletic. I thought, you know, he displayed some, some decent length. I mean, he's not, he's not huge. He's 5'10", 198. But overall, I, I thought he, he looked pretty good. And, um, you know, I, I'm just intrigued by him. And I, I think, you know, these one-on-one matchups with these receivers, you know, I don't think he's Christian Fulton or, or Jeff Okuda by any means. But like I mentioned earlier with like A.J. Terrell, I think he could maybe fall into that third, fourth round category and could be a nice find for a team with that athletic ability. So I'm curious to see what happens with him uh, at, at the senior bowl. Yeah, I'm definitely curious. There's a lot of safeties in this class, in this class in general, not necessarily at the, the senior bowl, but safeties and DBs that really are intriguing because they don't necessarily have that name recognition of a Xavier McKinney or mm-hmm. a Grant Delta or whoever it may be, but they're still really solid players. So I'm interested just to cover a very broad perspective, really interested in just seeing the DBs overall. Of course, you know, there's some corners that you get a little more uh, favoritism as far as viewing goes with the one-on-ones with the receivers. I'm definitely looking to that safety class. Um, Ashton Davis is one of those two that we'll get to later if we get that far. But I think he's a guy that it's going to be hard to necessarily see it in practice, but I think he's solid in pass coverage. But when he has to come downhill, play and runs and kind of fit some gaps in that run integrity. I think that's maybe where he struggles. So I may have to wait till Saturday for the game to see a little more of that, but I'm interested to see, you know, what his instincts are in that regard, but going to uh, sticking with the defensive side of the ball, Zach bond, the edge player out of Wisconsin Mm -hmm. had a super season, 12 and a half sacks, 19 and a half for loss. He has an explosive first step. I mean, his accelerator just right off the snap, he can almost be in the backfield. And so I definitely think he's a guy to keep an eye on. He's not super agility or or he doesn't have super agility or flexibility in his lower half, but he has enough flexibility to kind of dip his shoulder and get underneath tackles. He can play a little bit in a phone booth as far as power goes, but he has a hot motor and he can play the the flats very well. So I'm really interested to see just his overall, you know, body work. Where do they put him at in practices? Can he unlock his hips, play more in the flat when he's not lining up against a tight end or a running back? So I just think he has all the intrigue in the world. He has a lot of traits that could really kind of put him in. Possibly, I don't want to say he's not as dynamic as a pass rusher to me as Harold Landry, but I think Harold Landry in the role that he's played for Tennessee this year, you can keep him a little bit off the ball, but when you want him to put his nose down and go get the quarterback, he can do just that. He can play the flats as well. So I think those guys kind of draw some comparison just based on scheme and how they fit in an NFL defense. But Zach Bond's a guy that, I'm not saying he's going to be picked in the first round, but with a good week, I think you might hear some some noise and some mumblings about him being possibly one of the first uh, players taken off the board in round two. Yeah, I think you're you're hitting the nail on the head there. I think he's got the potential to be a, a top 50 pick for sure um, if he hasn't solidified that already. And again, it wouldn't surprise me, and I'm not trying to like scout the helmet here, but it wouldn't surprise me if he got in the first round like TJ Watt did, who you know maybe was more of a solidified first round pick at this point. But still, I, I think Bond could certainly do that. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm so intrigued by him as well. And I'm going to stick on the defensive side of the football. I'm actually going to throw two names here. Um, You know, obviously we could talk about defensive tackles like Kinlaw or Neville Gallimore. I'm excited for both those guys for sure. But the two guys I've got here, Raquan Davis, Alabama, and I I get it. Russ, what are you doing? Alabama, 6'7", defensive tackle. Why why are you excited about seeing him? You know, five-star recruit, all this and that. But remember, Raquan Davis really – has had a lot of inconsistencies. And I think if he could come in and prove himself and have a great week here, he might solidify himself as maybe a top 50 pick, a, a top 55 pick, top 60, whatever it might be. I think he could really solidify himself as maybe one of the top five defensive tackles. I don't know if he's necessarily there right now because of the inconsistencies that he displays. I mean, you know, there's, there's not always a ton of hand usage from him. Sometimes his motor is off. Sometimes there is no explosiveness off the snap and it. You know, I get it. Sometimes that's part of their read. That's their job as a defensive tackle. They can't 
go and be the, the, the first guy in the backfield. They kind of have to sit and wait and allow the stunts to happen and the blitzes and everything else. But overall, I think Raquan Davis, with his size, his length, matching up in some of these one-on-ones, if he brings what he's supposed to bring, I think he could really separate himself and maybe put himself in that Kinlaw, Gallimore conversation. Another guy, Devon Hamilton, D-tackle out of Ohio State. I was watching Tyler Biotish, and folks, I'm sorry if you can hear my son screaming playing Fortnite downstairs right now. Um, Understandable. Can you hear him? No. no. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, he's playing Fortnite. He's freaking out on there. Um, But, yeah, so Devon Hamilton, Ohio State, watching Tyler Biotish because, you know, we kind of saw some stuff on Biotish, me and you both, and we were like, you know what, let's watch this guy. And I don't know how many games you watched. I watched both games against Ohio State, the Big Ten title game and from the regular season. And I mean, I thought Biotish played well, but the guy that consistently stood out and was kind of a matchup nightmare for him was Devon Hamilton, who not the biggest guy in the world, but he's a guy that just, he's got good explosiveness, has a deadly swim move. And I think he could have a really big week here in this, in this week. And I think he's a guy that we could step back and say, why weren't we talking about him more? And maybe, almost like maybe like Justin Jones in a sense, because Justin Jones loved to, to bull rush, but he also loved using that swim move and sometimes a spin move coming out of NC State. So I think he could be a guy that falls into that third round category and maybe kind of puts together a, a decent first two, three, four, maybe even a, a longer career that expands to a second contract, depending on health and everything else. So those are, those are two more guys for me. Um, you can obviously take two guys as well if, if, you, if you'd like. Yeah, one guy that's kind of been, I don't want to say polarizing, but a guy that's had some intrigue pretty much through September to now, Josh Jones, the left tackle out of Houston. I go back and forth. Sometimes I see the traits where he could be, you know, uh, acceptable – Uh, I would say just linemen. I'm not going to necessarily point him at left tackle, um, but there are a lot of traits also where I'm like, I I don't see a starting uh, lineman here in the NFL. One, his feet are very solid. I think he has athletic feet. I think he he has a really solid kick slide. He can kind of mirror some uh, edge rushers, so I think he's fine there. As far And I think his anchor is okay if it's proportioned right. I think there's some times where his upper body is a little sporadic, his hand placement – I'll say it's a mess, but it's not consistent. I think he needs to figure out how to keep his hands in between the numbers, not necessarily always go for the outside shoulder pads or the shoulder. You got to keep that balance. You got to keep that core. And I think that's where most of his struggles come into play. But if he can find a way, and maybe this is, you know, the week that he can kind of tune that up a little bit and show potential, but if he can keep his body leverage based on his upper body, um, you know, hand usage and everything like that, I think he'll be okay. But I just I'm afraid that if that is not the case, then his anchor is going to be exposed. How strong is he? Those questions will come about. Um, So I'm just really looking forward to just seeing what Josh Jones is about, because, again, I see some of the traits that make him an intriguing prospect, but not in the sense of a top two, a top, you know, a day two pick. You know, I'm more looking at him maybe a late day two, early day three, if you're strictly looking at him as a left tackle, because right now I don't necessarily see a starting left tackle for me. I'm with you. I don't, I don't see a starting left tackle. And I, I, I like a lot of the things that you said, and you're the first one that I really remember talking about him and bringing him on to me. And you, you told me that you think he could potentially, if everything connects and everything's consistent, he could maybe have a Titus Howard type climb during yeah. the draft. And that was back in like August, September. So we'll see. It's a big week for him for sure. Uh, a big week for another guy, Darrell Taylor out of, Tennessee people have talked about him because he's explosive and when he puts it together he's pretty damn good but when you when you watch the tape there are some inconsistencies the lack of hand usage and really just the lack of that pass rush plan he doesn't necessarily come to the table prepared if he comes to the table prepared he's pretty good and there was times where he would you you know against Georgia, I give him a lot of credit because that's a game where he had to work his ass off. I mean, he's playing Andrew Thomas on one side, then he goes to the other side, and he's got a six foot seven right tackle in Isaiah Wilson, who's actually pretty good and might put himself in the conversation as as one of the better offensive tackles in this class if he can figure out some of the consistencies. More so with him, it's not a natural knee bender. 
and his hand con- his hand consistency and hand placement is very inconsistent at times. I mean, he's like hitting guys in the neck and in the head, but that's because he's six foot seven. But Taylor, for me, he was a dog in that Georgia game. Had a really nice push pull against Wilson, and really all throughout the course of his career, he's shown that explosiveness. And I think he he could put that on display and really work in, in the one on ones uh, here against the offensive tackles. Anthony Jennings as well from Alabama. They've got him listed as an inside linebacker. I'm curious on that because I yeah think- I don't I don't get that either. I was looking at the roster this morning and I saw that I was like, well, that's definitely interesting. Yeah, I view him more as a as an outside backer, an edge rusher for sure. And I think just that explosiveness from him is what really separates him um, from some, from some of these other guys. But maybe maybe this will be a blessing in disguise for him because you know the inside backers are okay i like malik harrison evan weaver's just a dog getting to the football i don't think he's real athletic but he's just finding ways to get his nose to the football and you've got guys like francis bernard and dj brunson or tj brunson jennings might be able to separate himself but uh yeah i mean it, it that that was a that was an odd one so th- those are two more names uh, i'm sure there's there's a couple more for you if you're interested in in continuing the conversation of senior bowl stuff yeah, just piggybacking off of Darrell Taylor, like that guy, I think he may have one of the best weeks out of everybody, mm-hmm. regardless of position. I mean, just the athletic profile he has, the flexibility, the strength. Um, I think he's going to win the weigh-in point of view. I think he's going to be a stud in practice because he shows some quickness. You just go back to the, his most recent game versus Indiana. He was just in the backfield constantly. He can win with power. He can win with quickness. He can bend off the edge. You can put him at a, a multitude of positions. He can gap fill. I think – he checks the boxes from a pass and run perspective. I think he's a guy that makes a lot of money too this week. Anthony Jennings as well. Um, if you go, if you want to get his full picture, you go back and watch that LSU game, and he's he, he's filling gaps. He's showing his quickness. I think he, you know, he's dipping under offensive linemen. He opens up for Terrell Lewis, who's also a linebacker from Alabama in this uh, uh, the Senior Bowl week as well. So I think those are three guys that definitely could make some money uh, quickly. Just a couple of wide receivers I got. Uh, Michael Pittman Jr. has been one of my favorites all year. Probably rank him a lot higher than a lot of other people do. But at, right now, he's a top 25 prospect, in my opinion. Uh, he shows a lot of ability vertically uh, and a little bit underneath. But I just want to see how consistently can he get, gain separation just, you know, with short area quickness. I think that's his one major thing. He's very long distance speed fast, but can is he is he faster than he is quick? And I think those are some of the questions that need to be answered. K.J. Hill, Ohio State. I think he's one of the more safe wide receiver prospects in this class. Uh, He's super productive in his career. Um, I think he's versatile as far as where you line him up. And I think he's one of the best route runners in this class overall. So I think he finds a multitude of ways to get open. And then quickly, we can both talk about this. This can be our final one to talk about. You alluded to him earlier before we started uh, our watch list here. But Anthony Gordon, the quarterback out of Washington State. Um, Eric Turner was watching a little bit of him yesterday. And Mm -hmm. I was just kind of – sitting back on Twitter just watching all the, the uh, uh, cut-ups that he had. But Gordon, he, he's a very interesting prospect. I know a lot of people are going to jump on him about his mechanics and just – it's not a motor issue, but how he just kind of – is not necessarily a statue, but he just doesn't have that much movement in mm-hmm. his lower body. He kind of throws off base, but he has a super quick release. When he makes that decision, he is firing it there. You really like to see that. He has a little bit of that eye manipulation that you don't see from most quarterbacks. So you get the feel that he's going through his progressions. He's really kind of has that cerebral aspect where he's reading the secondary and throws guys open. Uh, So Anthony Gordon's a guy that, of course, he's going to be overshadowed by Justin Herbert, Jalen Hurts, probably even Jordan Love as well. But I think he's a guy that with that Gardner Minshew intrigue now that showed a little bit of ability um, that, you know, you could, you could find some success with a later round quarterback and that pass happy offensive system isn't necessarily a black mark on your scouting report. I think Gordon's gaining a lot of buzz and he will continue to gain a lot of buzz this week in Mobile. I'll, I'll get to Gordon in a minute and Jordan Love in a minute, but I wanted to talk about the receivers real fast that you had. And, you know, I, I really like Michael Pittman and I, I think this is going to be a good week for him, especially from – teams that are looking for some bigger body receivers receivers that have no problem climbing the ladder player you know these these big body receivers that have good body control and and attack the catch you know high point and attack the catch point and everything like that but to be honest I think guys like 
you know, Devin Duvernay, guys like KJ Hill, Van Jefferson, Courtney Davis, the guys that are really good route runners, I think could separate themselves and maybe even put themselves ahead of guys like Denzel Mims, Michael Pittman, and maybe even like Brian Edwards and maybe Antonio Gandy Golden. Gandy Golden, who, you know, these guys are bigger body receivers. I don't think they're going to move as well. And you could probably add Colin Johnson to that list as well as a bigger body receiver. I don't think they're going to move as well as the guys I listed from, from Jefferson Hill and, and Davis and stuff like that and Duvernay. So I'm really curious how teams value that and how really the draft community and other scouts and evaluators value that in regards to those wide receivers. Cause I think it's a really good group of wide receivers. It's going to be competitive. I think James Proach from SMU working with the lions, I think could maybe put himself in, in a kind of his own category. I don't want to say like he's a, he's, you know, number one receiver or anything, but I think he could put himself in a category where teams will value him and his ability. And I think that more so for like teams like the lions, they might fly under the radar and look in the third and fourth round and say, Hey, we're going to take this guy. We worked with him directly. We really like him and we could use him out of the slot and everything, but moving to Anthony Gordon and Jordan love, I think it's a big week for both of those guys because Jalen hurts. He's an established winner. He's a really good leader. He's very, very good off the field as far as his his ability to talk to the media and everything else. And, you know, he's a mobile quarterback. He's going to separate himself as his ability to run. But he's got a strong arm, and he made some really nice throws early in the year. And then once Oklahoma got figured out a little bit with what Jalen Hurts was doing, the, the passing game for him kind of went away and the numbers went away, but he was establishing himself as, you know, kind of that read option RPO quarterback and design quarterback runs. And I think that's going to, to put himself in a good spot. Justin Herbert, we all know about him. He is what he is at this point. Can he get better? Certainly with some NFL coaching, but I'm a little concerned as far as, you know, what he is. He might not get any better, might not get any worse, but he's, he's I don't know, he's dicey. But Gordon and Love, Love, obviously the interviews are going to be huge for him. He had the, the marijuana possession or the controlled possession. Uh, substance possession I, I believe it was marijuana though uh, right before the bowl game you have Anthony Gordon you know like you mentioned lower body mechanics are a little off he's like a statue yes a little stiff in his lower body but that release is great he can make uh-huh. it seems like just about every single throw on the field and he makes some dumb decisions don't get me wrong I mean he's not perfect but I think he could solidify himself as maybe QB three, four, or five, depending on how you view a guy like Jacob Eason or Jake Fromm. And I would be more comfortable taking Anthony Gordon before I take Jake Fromm. I'd probably be more comfortable taking Anthony Gordon before Jalen Hurts, Shea Patterson, Steven Montez, forget about it. But, you know, maybe even Jordan Love. And I think Anthony Gordon is, is going to have a really good week with the Lions coaching staff. I'm intrigued by that one because, you know, obviously as a Lions fan, I'm just – I'm I'm so intrigued what this team does with these practices and seeing what they do with these players and how they value them moving forward in the draft. And I think he could fly under the radar of the Lions and maybe be a good developing quarterback underneath Stafford, who, yeah, not this year, but maybe in the future, depending on how the back goes, he could maybe retire or maybe they move on from him. And, and it's I hate saying it, but that could be an option. And Anthony Gordon could be a guy – with them working directly with him, they might value him and fall in love with him in this draft process. So we'll see. I think all these guys are going to have a huge week. Do you have anybody else you want to add to the list or or, are you, I think you've got most of your guys out of the way. Yeah, I think I covered most of them. I was looking forward to Jeff Gladney, the TCU cornerback, but he was taken off uh, the senior bowl list. So, uh, so yeah, that was kind of disappointing because I think he had a lot of, you know, top four, top five cornerback type ability. And he still does. I'm not saying he had to have this week to solidify that, but I think it definitely would have helped because I think he would have stood out in this cornerback class in Mobile. For sure. And another guy too, Justin Heron from, or Heron, I don't know how to say last names, folks. You know this. Offensive tackle from Wake Forest. I remember watching him like two years ago and I thought I, he had, you know, a relatively clean lower body. Kick slide looked good. Hand placement was pretty consistent. He could anchor. So I haven't watched him a ton this year. So I'm kind of curious, has he developed more? Has he gotten worse? But maybe he has a good week and separates himself, kind of like maybe we are thinking with Josh Jones and obviously the health of Trey Adams' offensive tackle for Washington. So we could talk about this stuff all day long. But CP, 
Uh, I don't have anything else. I appreciate you taking the time. I hope you have safe travels on your way to Mobile, Alabama. Um, is there going to be rain in the forecast for you? Um, maybe this weekend, but I think we had a big stretch because since I live in Alabama, we had a big stretch of rain come through last week. So I think, knock on wood, I think uh, the rain's clear, but it is Mobile, Alabama, where <laughs> average rain is more than Washington. So I'm sure there'll be at least one day. Let's just hope it's Friday. Yeah, let's hope so. And hopefully that doesn't delay my flight out of there, but we'll see. Uh, my man, you safe travels. Take care. You guys, of course, can follow CP on Twitter at underscore Christian page. You can follow me on Twitter at Russ NFL draft. Remember, smash the follow buttons. And then of course you need to find us on Apple podcasts, Spotify, wherever you go about listening to your podcast, you just simply search cover one NFL draft podcast. You'll find it. All you got to do is rate review, subscribe, Add us to your podcast playlist. Put us in your rotation. I promise you will not regret it. CP, safe travels, my man. We will talk to you all throughout the week, um, and we will talk to everybody sometime next week as we, we preview more Senior Bowl stuff and give some recaps and all that stuff. So until next time, this is the Cover One NFL Draft Podcast.